This detailed clay coil lantern tutorial will show you through the fundamentals of working with clay. I will show you how to make decorative coils, how to a score slip and blend to attach them to make a form that is structurally sound and beautiful and how to leave gaps so that when it's finished, it can turn into a beautiful glowing clay lantern. You can do this with air dry clay and my finished result, I am using a battery operated tea light candle. So get out your clay grab your favorite clay tools i'll put my favorites in the description box below and let's make a coil clay lantern if you love learning about art hit that subscribe button to help this public school teachers side hustle for the base of my coil lantern i find it best to use a pinch pot take a piece of clay that you can fit in your hand and form it very gently into a sphere I am going to take off my jewelry here because clay gets everywhere. If you want a more in-depth approach to how to make a pinch pot, click the link above and I'll walk, it, walk you through it a little bit more slowly. Once you have your sphere, you're going to give it a thumbs up. You're going to press until your knuckle disappears, using one hand to support and the other to pinch and turn, pinch and turn, pinch and turn all the way around. Now between your thumb and your pointer finger is going to create the lip of your pinch pot, so don't take your fingers and like press that to make it really thin you want the lip or the outer edges of your pinch pot to be very secure I also like to kind of tap it on the table and then I'm going to spend a little bit of time smoothing it to get the nice texture I'm looking for the size of your pinch pot will be determined by how much clay you have to start with if you feel like it's a little bit too big or too small adjust accordingly it doesn't have to be a circle either you can take the pinch pot and form it into an oval a square an organic shape um, whatever you are looking for for your pinch pot base. I'm gonna speed things up because I am simply smoothing things out with my fingers. So when I add my coils, everything uh, has my best craftsmanship. Technique is coil building. Coil building, you'll need smaller pieces of clay. You'll take your hand and form them into a cylinder. Take both hands and press towards the center, rolling out. It takes a little bit of practice and if it flattens out, just use your fingers to kind of pinch it. And if you want a more in-depth look at how to build a coil pot, click this link above. We will be using lots of coils, but this is a lantern, so there will be gaps and holes in the coil building that we do. Okay, so that's one. Let's make another. Take your hands and make it into a cylindrical shape. Both hands from the center. Let me move that out of the way. Press and roll, trying to put the same pressure along the coils. If you've ever made a snake out of Play-Doh, this is exactly the same technique. You can see I'm moving my hands as needed to the areas that are a little bit thicker than the others. This coil is a little bit skinnier. With your foundation coils or your coils at the bottom of the pot, you want those to be about the thickness uh, somewhere between your thumb and your pointer finger. Sometimes the ends of the coils get a little bit weird, so I just pinch off any clay that I don't want and then I will add it to another ball of clay and reuse it. So this coil is a little bit skinnier because I'm going to show you how to make a twist. To make your twist, connect the clay at the top. So I just kind of fold it. Then you're gonna do an over, under, over, under type technique. And then you twist one side until it uh, becomes as tight of a twist or as loose of a twist as you would like. Sometimes it takes a little bit of work to play around with it. And keep in mind your coil is going to be only as good as you made it, or I should say the twist is gonna only be as good as you made the coil. So if your coil is uneven or cracked or anything that's not like just standard, you wanna perfect the coil first. Cause once you twist it together, it's not impossible. You can see that I am kind of working it, but it is a little bit more challenging. Now it's time to make a braid. So we have our basic coil. We have a twist and now we're going to level up and braid three pieces of clay. Your braid can be as thick or as thin as you would like it to be. If you've never braided before, I'm going to give you just a very brief introduction. Um, I'm assuming you already know how to braid. I'm just going to show you how to braid with clay. If you've never made a braid before in your life, I am sure there's some YouTuber out there with a fantastic step-by-step -step tutorial. With the braid, the concept is you need three even pieces. Now I'm gonna make my coils pretty skinny for this. And again, your coils could be thick or thin depending on what style or like how far up your lantern they go. I do want them to be the same length, so I'm just kind of guesstimating and cutting each coil so that they match. Once I have my pieces um, fairly even, I'm going to just press them together at the top so that they're one unit and attached. And then I'm doing the basic braid technique where it is 
right over center, left over center, right over center, left over center, right over center, left, right. And so what is in the middle always changes, which gives the braided effect. I did start with my left hand side, by the way. Um, so whatever side works for you. And then I pinched together at the end and I have this cute little braid that hopefully I'll be able to use in my lantern. Now that I have a variety of coils to work with, I'm also going to use some hand uh, constructed shapes. And so I want to have some spheres. So I'm just taking my hand and rolling uh, these shapes and I'm gonna score slip and blend those. And that's gonna give the coil a different shape to follow than just the pinch pot. So I'm on the fence as to whether to do two or three. Three has a nice asymmetry to it, but two is very symmetrical. So I think I'm gonna go with two. Um, and remember, if you've never worked with clay before, every time you add two pieces of clay, you must score, slip, and blend. Ring opens up the clay surface on both surfaces that you're attaching. Slip is like the glue that holds the two pieces together. So these score marks are very important and a lot of times students are too timid, so make sure you're really scratching into the clay. Here's slip that is made of a combination of clay and water. If you've never made slip before, click the link above and I'll walk you through it. It's so easy, it's just warm water and dried out clay. Now the blending part is crazy important. So you can see I'm taking my time going around the surface of the clay to really connect the two together. You want there to be no line of separation. You want it to look as if they're both the same piece of clay. So each step is super important and it doesn't matter how small the piece is, something like this little sphere that I made or something as important as like a, uh, a coil that is holding together the whole pot. So to repeat, here are my score marks. And again, that goes on both surfaces what you're attaching and what you're attaching it to. You only have to put slip on one surface. Uh, so I went ahead and put it on that little sphere. I'm putting my aggressive score marks exactly where I want the clay to go. I'm pressing down. Then I'm gonna turn it on its side and I'm gonna use a clay tool to blend it together. You could use your fingers, but I felt like I really couldn't get the exact detail of blending I wanted with my finger. So I'm using this wooden clay tool. I'll put my favorite clay tools in the description box. Another fun way to use coils is to make spirals. So I'm going to use the same techniques and I'm gonna roll a nice long coil with very consistent sizes um, or thicknesses, I should say. And then I'm gonna take that coil, I'm gonna take one end of it and then I'm gonna wrap it into a spiral. Be picky with that first curl um, because it does show up and I don't want it to look kind of flat. That has a nice shape to it. And then I'm just gonna roll it until it runs out of, or I run out of clay and make a really fun little spiral. A really fun addition for decorative coil pots as well as the lantern that I'm making. And if you research um, ancient Japanese pottery, um, you'll see a lot of really cool decorative techniques using coils. I'm gonna skip ahead. I'm gonna make several of these. So I'm gonna go ahead and speed things up since you've seen me make one. I'm just gonna repeat three times. I got kind of a wild idea while playing around with clay. And so I'm gonna quickly roll another coil and I'm gonna see if I can build a shape using a spiral and a coil that looks like an eyeball. Um, I think that'd be a really cool uh, theme for my lantern. So I'm just kind of playing around. I haven't done this before, but I'm taking my coil and making kind of the outer eye shape. I am blending it. Keep in mind, I will be score slipping and blending this to a new piece of clay. So that little pinch I'm doing at the end, that will work for now because it will be attached and score slip and blended onto a new surface. So that will take care of that. Now that I have my eye shape, I'm gonna make a little pupil with this tiny little baby piece of coil right here and I'm going to let that be the iris. So just kind of twisting that up carefully, making sure it's about the right size. And I'm definitely gonna score slip and blend this to the inside of the eye because I know it's gonna kind of hang open, if that makes sense. I'll show you when I actually attach it. So the coil is such a bigger shape, I wanna score slip and blend that to the outer eye so that it doesn't dry out at a different rate of speed and so that it uh, sticks together. Um, so you can see I'm using a needle tool this time because this is such a small little shape and I'm attaching where the spiral is going to touch both sides of the coil. So a lot of times students want to just kind of stick it together and don't understand why score slipping and blending is so important because it will stick when there's moisture in the clay. But clay has to be bone dry, completely free of moisture before you can put it in the kiln. And so if you just like sit it on there and hope for the best, 
once your clay dries out, it will fall off, I promise. Um, and so to build a really structurally sound work of art, you always score a slip and blend. It's just one of the things you have to do. It's like building a house and not nailing down the wood and just like letting the wood hang out there and hoping that a wind doesn't come by and knock it down. That's the analogy I always like to give my students. And even a tiny little piece of clay like this, I'm so carefully blending it. You don't skip steps no matter how big or how small your pieces of clay are. Always, always, always score, slip, and blend. I really like how this turned out. I also like the dimension of the eye lid being in front. I know I'm gonna have a really cool use for this as I progress. I have some really cool things to work with, spirals, eyeballs, a variety of coils. I'm gonna do one more type of coil before I get started actually constructing. And it is good practice to kind of make your shapes and then build as you go. Clay is really heavy from all the moisture. So if I were just to start adding each piece as I made it, it could weigh down the clay. Timing with clay is so important. Um, so I'm gonna make one more type while my other pieces kind of dry out and firm up just a little bit. And I call this the onion ring or the circle. And basically I'm just taking a coil, making it smaller, and then making a circle, blending each edge. Now I know I didn't score slip and blend that edge, but it's fresh clay, same level of um, moisture. And remember I'm score slipping and blending it to a new surface, so it should be just fine. Just like before, I am going to repeat my steps and I'm gonna make several of these. So when I'm building my lantern and constructing it, it's like I have all my uh, wood already ordered and it's on the job site. So I don't have to make everything as I go. I kind of have this like supply of things that I can build with. And I will make things as I go as well. But like I said, you want it to kind of firm up because if you start stacking these shapes, you want them to not kind of fold in on themselves. Now I'm gonna start building my lantern on my pinch pot base, which has firmed up. If you start building directly on your pinch pot without giving it the chance to dry out just a little bit, it will kind of collapse on itself and it will slowly change its form. So my pinch pot has been sitting out for about 30 minutes. I had it in front of the fan. Um, a lot of times I have my students make their pinch pot one class period and then not attach anything until at least the next day. So that's another way you can do it if you don't have a fan to put it in front of as well. I'm taking one of my basic coils and you saw me sit it on top and kind of measure. And I'm doing the same onion ring technique that I did before where I'm connecting the coil in a circle before attaching it to the two spheres in my pinch pot. And that's gonna leave a little bit of a gap and it actually makes a really cool eye shape which is gonna go along with my theme. So once you have everything blended out and your coil is pretty to look at and there's no weak spots and there's no like indentions, um, I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to score, slip, and blend a coil to your first layer. So I'm gonna drape it over, measuring it again to make sure it's exactly the way I want it to be. And then everywhere that the clay is touching another piece of clay, see what I mean by the eye effect? That is going to be scored, slipped, and blended. And then where that little piece of clay is touching the coil of, or the pinch pot, I'm going to put score marks where it's touching. And then the coil itself, I'm gonna put score marks. And I always kind of add a little bit of extra uh, just in case, cause I'm gonna blend it out anyway. Check my work, yep, that touches. Um, and then you can either score it or put slip now, or you can do the other side. You'll kind of figure out what works for you. Go ahead and my slip needs to be about the consistency of a melted frosty, very nice. And then I'm gonna take a shish kebab stick so I use a lot of different blending tools and I'm gonna to press it together and you see how I'm blending it, but then I'm using the shish kebab stick to kind of scrape that indention back in. You want, or I want the coil to be separate um, and look as if it's a different piece, but I know that it needs to be blended so it's structurally sound. So with coil pots, especially when you show the coil, that's a balance that needs to be found. Like how do I not blend it to where the coils all blend together, but blend it enough that it's going to be structurally sound. And that is something that you kind of do by touch and you get used to as your experience with clay and with coil building continues. When in doubt, do it twice. I added a little bit more score marks on the edge um, so that that is nice. And then I'm going to blend it. You won't be able to see the inside as much as the outside, but since I can in this moment, I'm going to blend it just as well. Okay, I'm gonna repeat my steps on the other side. Let's speed things up right here. Where the two pieces of clay will be touching, I'm gonna to start by adding my score marks. 
I'm doing this with a needle tool, but you can do it with a fork. Um, I really like my shish kebab stick or my bamboo, bamboo skewer. So remember, score marks on both sides of the objects that are touching. Slip in the middle, blend it well. You can either make your coils look as if they're blended into one, or like me, carefully leave that indention so you can tell that the coils are stacked on top of each other. Totally depends on your aesthetic, your vibe, what you want your pot to look like. And you can always go back and change it if you uh, want your coil to be a little bit more blended. I have made so many decorative elements and now it's time to start stacking them to create height with my coil pot. So I'm just kind of playing around to see do I want to use my spirals, my circles, my eyeball, and the principle never changes. Whenever two pieces of clay touch, score both sides, slip in the middle, and blend for stability. So there's going to be tons of repetition in this video. You're seeing the same thing over and over again. So if you're making your own coil pot, Ceramics and pottery is a practice of repetition. So there's no shortcut. Um, every single thing you add has to be scored, slip, and blended so it can dry uniformly. And it's just like building a house. You wouldn't just stack the pieces of wood on top of each other. You have to nail them together to make sure it's structurally sound. I'm going with my spirals here and I am just winging it. I don't have a sketch. I have an idea in mind, but not a final outcome. So it might be a good idea to sit down and sketch out what you want it to look like or just put on some music and let it go and kind of see what happens. As long as you score, slip and blend, pay attention to the dry time of your clay and make sure not to work too fast. If I were to score, slip and blend every single coil I made when they are very, very moist, yes, I know, terrible word, um, it'd be very difficult for stability because the clay pot would be very heavy. So these are all things to consider when working with clay. And I have had students build beautiful pots that crack later because they are too heavy or the clay was built too quick. So clay will teach you the lessons it's gonna teach you. It's a very friendly material in some ways, but it will turn against you also. So my clay doesn't turn against me. I have balled up a paper towel and stuck it on the inside of my pot. So while I'm designing it, um, it has a little extra balance and the clay doesn't have to hold its shape all by itself. This would be taken out as the clay dries. You would never put this in the kiln because, you know, it's going to burn, turn to ash, and I don't want to mess up my kiln. Uh, but this is a great way to practice getting stability as you're building. And I can already tell that my clay is super, um, has lots of moisture in it. I just made these coils and so they're a little bit heavy. So I have a feeling I'm gonna add this top coil as I did on the other side on top of my spiral. And this might be as far as I can get, um, as far as the actual construction of the coil pot today. So listen to your clay if it's acting like it's too heavy or it's gonna collapse in on itself. Build slowly, put it in front of a fan, work on your craftsmanship and then come back to it a few minutes later when it's not quite as moist. So you can see there I'm attaching um, where that coil touches that first coil I made on top of the spiral and it gives it a really cool eye shape. You might notice that this one I am blending, I kind of want the seamless look, like this coil is sitting on top of all of my spirals um, and it helps give it height, but I do want this kind of eyelid effect there. And again, I'm just making it up as I go, seeing if I like the outcome. Then on the other side of the spiral, yes, I sped things up again. I'm scored, I am using my score marks. I'm gonna put slip and then blend that so um, it's a finished look. And again, I really like everything here is kind of mimicking an eye and I really like how the coil sitting on top of that round spiral gives it that effect. I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. I took out my paper towel just so I could have a little bit more um, control on the inside. Again, you won't see as much of the inside of the lantern, but because there are holes and it will be open at the top, you'll see enough that you don't want to just pretend like it's not there. For the sake of symmetry, I'm going to take a coil just like I did before, a short one. I'm going to stack it over the spiral that touches the edge of the coil on the other side to give my eyelid type effect. Then wherever the coil touches the coil below it and on top of the spiral, I'm going to put score marks. You guessed it, I'm gonna put slip where the score marks touch and then I'm gonna blend. So repetition, repetition, repetition. And making a coil lantern can be a little bit tricky because you need to build it structurally sound, but I'm also trying to leave gaps for decorative purposes. So it is a little bit of a puzzle to kind of figure out where do you want to leave openings and where do you want decorative elements with your coils without making something that's not going to be structurally sound. 
So you can see I put slip in those three places, taking my blending tool again, and yes, you guessed it, we're going double speed since this is the second time you've seen me repeat these steps on a very similar shape. Remember, as long as your clay is score slip and blended where it touches, you should be good to go and make sure to work slowly just in case your clay uh, becomes too heavy too fast. I feel like I don't want to add too much more at this state, so I'm going to let my pieces dry a little bit and the form itself. So what I'm going to do is take those decorative pieces that I made and stack them on the coil pot. Now again, if your coil pot feels like it's going to break, put them in separate bags, but these coil pieces are going to dry out very quickly. But if clay stays together, it dries slower because it's a larger mass. I'm going to take a spray bottle and spritz it just once because I don't want uh, the clay to fall apart. And then I'm gonna wrap it up nice and tight in a bag um, and I'll come back to it the next day. And if by next day you mean almost a week later, then yes, here we go. I'm removing all my pieces from my bag. Um, I don't remember why I took so long from my piece, probably just busy at school, and my clay pieces have dried out significantly. Luckily though, they're already formed and they match the level of dryness of what I'm adding them to. So you always want your clay to be about at the same level of dry dryness when you're attaching your pieces together. So I do need to spray this because I didn't make all the pieces I'm going to use, but I'm gonna go ahead and score, slip, and blend and continue with my decorative coil pot. I'll be making more pieces and I shouldn't have taken this far away from my clay, but it happens. Sometimes if you're at school, you'll get a week of snow days and you're in the middle of a clay project. So it's not like you can't make it work. Just keep a spray bottle nearby and spray your clay so that it isn't too dry. Not You don't want it to be leather hard. You wanna be able to move your clay pieces, but make sure it's not so dry that it's going to crack and break and just not be workable. With my fresh slip and all my score marks in place, I'm going to start um, attaching some of these circles that I made. Um, again, this is a repetition of steps, no new information, just attaching the coils that I made using the score slip and blend method. My clay is much more dry, and so this wooden tool is um, blending a lot easier. I'd have a hard time doing this with my fingers because the clay um, is at a different dry time. So you can see I'm using a variety of these wooden tools, and I'll put my favorite clay tools in the description box. You can use your hands. You, can, you don't need a lot of tools, but there's some really cool ones out there that make working with clay that much more fun. I'm going to attach my circle on the other side. And again, this is double the speed because it's all about the same repetition, score, slip, and blending. And so I'm mapping out my score marks on both sides of the clay, putting slip in the middle and blending. And I'm making it up as I go. I don't have a sketch or a plan, which, you know, there's beauty to that. But also a lot of times my students have these beautiful sketches with details of where their coils are gonna go, how big, what size, the shape and design. Um, that's probably a better way to go, but you know, here I go anyway. One thing that I am thinking right now is that my coils are going in and making the opening of my lantern pretty small. So my next step needs to be, how do I make this taller and be able to fit a candle? Because I don't wanna close off the bottom because that's where the candle is going to sit. And I have these small little tea lights I plan on using. So I'm a little bit stuck on what to do next. I think the best thing, I'm kind of playing around with uh, my little circles that I made. I feel like the next thing I need to do is just use basic coils to kind of give it, um, not a belt, what am I thinking? Like an endpoint of the decoration and give it like a platform where I can add more decorative pieces. So I have my spirals, I have my circles, but I need something stable so I can build up. So I'm gonna play around with this coil and see if I can create just structure that's going up that will then allow me to build more on top of that. Do I have a plan? Nope, but I'm just playing around with this coil and seeing what I can do to give it a little bit more vertical height. So before I attach it, I feel like it needed a little extra something. So I'm going to create this little tiny spiral thing that I'm gonna drape over the coil to give it one more eyeball because that is my vision and my theme is a lantern with eyeballs. Just adding this tiny little spiral and this is going to mimic those uh, spheres that I used at the beginning of the video to give the coil some movement to drape over it in a way that gives it um, a little bit more of a visual decorative effect. And yes, even the smallest pieces like this have to be score slip and especially blended. So this 
looks really awkward, almost like my coil pot has a snaggle tooth, but I'm gonna take that coil that I draped over, drape it over that circle to create one more eyeball shape um, and kind of go from there. So my game plan now is to get more coils. So I'm gonna make some onion rings that make the coil pot go up and also not have such a small opening. After walking away from it and coming back, I'm going to stack the coils like I talked about just to create that nice structural element. Um, so you can see just where you left off, um, I am stacking. I think I'm gonna do about three total um, so that it gives it some height that I can work with. So once I have my onion ring, once I measured it out, I'm gonna blend it together, stack it on top, and then you can see that this has a much larger opening. And then I'm gonna add one on top of that. I don't remember how many total I have. I'm sure I'll turn it to the side and we can see. Okay, so this one's about the same width. So that's one thing to say, if you want your clay to go in, make your onion ring smaller. If you want your clay to go out, make each one slightly uh, larger in width. So now that I have about three uh, coils stacked on top of those coils I ended with, I'm going to do the task of score slipping and blending them. Now this is some fresh clay and I'm stacking it on top of clay that has dried a little. So I have been very consciously spraying the bottom of the pot, making sure it's wrapped up really tight when I'm storing it. Um, because, you know, building with wet clay on top and clay that is over a week old and drying on the bottom can be tricky. So again, paying attention to the moisture of your clay and never having your clay uh, dry out too quickly. Um, so my score marks here is it's a little bit tricky because it's touching most of the coil. Sometimes I overscore it because I can always go back and blend it out. So that's a trick. Um, and I'm marking here to see where I need to add my score marks. So have them mapped out, have my score marks here, adding my slip, carefully lining those bad boys up. Another option is just to put score marks on the whole thing, the bottom of the coil. You're blending it anyway, so why not? I'm reinforcing with some score marks on the side and the edges of the coil, and then I'm taking my trusty wooden tool and blending so that it's very nice and structurally sound while keeping the coils independent of each other. Well, this looks familiar, doesn't it? A whole bunch of score slipping and blending. Um, again, loving this shish kebab bamboo skewer to get those coils, um, get their identity back, and then the wooden tool to really blend those edges and then going in to clean them up. So it's a lot of building, cleaning, building, cleaning. You do wanna clean as you go, but just know it's just like this example I've used so many times, building a house, even a brand new house that's under construction has dust everywhere. So you clean it as you go, but it still is a house under construction. So as you can see, I still have some nice gaps. The coil has this nice lean to it. And now for the easy part, really, the next coils I add are just gonna stack on each other flat. So I sped things up here. I'm putting score marks on the entire surface of both coils, both little onion rings that I made. And this is just your traditional coil pot. Um, score marks on both sides, slip in the middle and blending because this is gonna act as like a buffer from the decoration from the bottom to the top. This is like um, just an area to create good structure and balance. I'm blending just all the way around score marks on the whole coils. In this, I was feeling like my clay was getting away from me a little bit and these two coils kind of balancing things out just make me feel like their structure again. I have a third, so I could put that there or I could take the eyeball that I made and do that and then put the third coil on top. So let's kind of play around with what that looks like. The eye has dried out quite a bit, but I have sprayed it and that works very well. It still gives it structure. The eye is so large. Um, I think I'm gonna do that and get that eyeball right there on top, adding my score marks, score marks on the bottom. And I'm using one of these wooden tools, not the shish kebab stick, just cause it's a large area. And then have my eyeball kind of fit there. Of course, I have to blend once I have it projected kind of the way I want it. Um, and I made a really nice thick top and bottom eyelid, which is very easy to blend. This clay's a little bit more fresh with the slip, so I use my finger and then I go in with my shish kebab stick, as always, to clean it up and get those score marks out of the way. Then take my shish kebab stick and redefine those coils since my design relies on letting the coils show in a decorative way. 
Now that that's nice and secure, I'm going to take that third and final coil and stack it on top of the eyeball and that second coil that I added just by itself. So I love this because it's decorative, but it also has a really nice sense of structure. And I feel like if this were one of my students' pots, I'd say, go bigger, make it larger. This is an example piece for me um, for this video to show technique. I never work as large or with my own personal voice as much as I could in these videos because I'm a public school teacher. The time in my day just doesn't allow for it. So I feel like I'm kind of reaching the end of the goals I set for myself. So I'm thinking now after attaching this top piece, like where do I go from here and how do I end or finish this piece because the top coil is really important. As I'm asking myself these questions, I decide to add one more coil on top of this one for just a little bit more height and so that there's kind of like a two coil buffer from that eye. So I'm gonna time lapse that because you have seen me do this several times and it's just an onion ring that I fit, score slipping and blending, cleaning up my lines, all that good stuff. Let's time lapse that and then come back and see how to finish the coil pot. So the top of your finished piece is really important. Think of this as like the crown of your coil pot. And so it needs to be your best coil or a decorative idea. And I'm really not sure what I wanna do here. When in doubt, I'm just taking a piece of clay that I rolled into a coil and I'm just playing around with some shapes. I have this idea of like leaving some gaps that have like an eyeball type effect or like a squiggly line kind of like I don't know, 90s style. And I'm just playing around with those ideas, looking at it. Um, you're seeing it from the top view. I'm also looking at it from the side. Like, what do those gaps look like? Now, this clay is really fresh. Um, so it's not, it's kind of heavy. It's kind of holding its shape and then not. So what you're seeing me do is just play around with different ideas. I could make like several little eyeballs and score slip and blend them on top. I could make little spheres. Um, I could do anything. That's the beauty of clay is whatever you want to do, you can. But I think what I'm going to do here is leave these coils with gaps and make it kind of like a decorative squiggly line. Worst case scenario, if I don't like it, I'll just rip it off next time I work with it. So I'm going to go ahead and score, slip and blend. Yes, I sped things up since you've seen me do this so many times before. Don't need to put score marks where the gaps were, but because I wasn't sure where I wanted them to be, I went ahead and just scored the whole thing. And then this is going to be tricky because the score marks are going to touch in odd places. So I'm actually gonna wrap this up for the day and come back to it. And now that it's a little bit more dry, I'm gonna spritz it. I don't remember how long I took away from this, but long enough for the coils to kind of hold their form. Um, so now I know exactly where the clay touches because the clay has dried out a little bit. Another option is to set it in front of a fan, make sure to turn it and clay this small dries out pretty quickly. So it doesn't need to be in front of a fan for too long. My top coil happens to be in two pieces. I don't know why it happened that way. I certainly could have made it one, but because I'm blending it, it's totally fine. So you can see from this angle, the fun little gaps that it left and it has this like squiggly uh, vibe to it and the open gaps kind of mimic the motif of the eyeballs that I've been doing this whole time. So remember, this is my show coil. I need to be super detailed. I wanna make sure it's blended well, that the coils have their identity still. And so I'm gonna spend a lot of time smoothing and blending and making this top coil really my best work. Speaking of my best work, now that I've just so quickly cleaned all that up, it's time for cleanup on all parts of the clay pot. Once your clay has dried a little bit, it's not quite leather hard, but almost, at least the bottom of mine is. I'm gonna go back and there's so many tools you can use. I'm using a lot that you've seen me use before. And now that the clay has firmed up a little bit, I'm re carving in some of those lines, dusting them off. So some tools to use at this stage, um, I have a paintbrush. One thing you don't wanna do is paint the whole thing with slip. I see a lot of students get smooth, happy, and they just like take a paintbrush. I'm actually gonna use the paintbrush when the clay's kind of dry, but it's not quite time for that yet. I'm just going in with my shish kebab stick and getting those coils, laying it on its side, and just perfecting the way they look. So I'm getting my indention smooth, I'm carving in deep where I want it to go. And this is going to be a lot of effort that pays off because my analogy again of building a house is that now that it's all constructed, it's time to paint the trim, it's time to sweep, it's time to install the lights and all the wallpaper, the decorative elements, and really get this thing looking finished. 
my dad was a contractor and he built houses so that's probably why i'm always thinking like house analogies and you can spend hours and hours doing this you can see that my clay is not dried out be careful doing this with dry clay here it's dried for a little bit longer and so i'm using a brush this clay is leather hard in some areas. You never want to carve into bone dry clay. Clay dust has silica in it, even the school grade clay, and it's really bad to breathe that in long term. So although I'm using the brush to dust off some of the clay pieces, don't let it dry out completely. One, it'll be totally fragile, and two, it's just not healthy to breathe in that dust. So you don't want to like get out sandpaper. Um, I know a lot of potters and ceramic artists, they'll use steel wool. I don't do that in the classroom just because I don't want to breathe it in. So if you were to do something like that, wear a mask. Um, you don't want to have breathing issues or worse because of choices you made when you were young working with clay. I am now going to time lapse this because I have over 40 minutes of footage of me doing the same thing over and over again. But one extra thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to carve some details. So as you remember, eyeballs um, and eyes are kind of the theme. So I am going to carve in um, some of those fine details to give it that aesthetic that I'm looking for. Could I leave it just the way it is? Of course, but I'm gonna pick some areas to carve in and draw some more details to make it look more like an eye. I'm also gonna use a brush because my clay is leather hard now, and so I can kind of dust away some of that with the brush. This is where you can be so creative. Uh, think of it as drawing into the clay. Get out your inner sculptor and think what textures and 3D elements can I add? And the sky's the limit. It's like a blank canvas that you created that isn't flat. And I could just spend hours and hours and often do spend that amount of time perfecting the forms, carving in textures. Clay is a blank slate. So just really enjoy this phase, even if you're just not adding as much as just touching up areas that you've already carved or already added. So like your coils, you know, go in and make them sharp, go in and make where they touch really clean. Um, and if smooth is the texture you want, great, but smooth is just one texture and you can really have fun carving in lots of different details. Another great tool is the ribbon or the loop tool when your clay is at this stage of dryness. So basically it's a metal loop and you can shave down leather hard or close to it clay. You don't wanna use this when your clay is still moist because it just catches. You want it to be a little bit more firm and you can shape up the bottom or the foot of your coil pot and you can use this to slim things down, create a smooth texture. Now it's pretty addicting so be careful because once you carve it, it's gone. But that is such a great tool um, to just give it a smooth cohesive look. Let's carve another eyeball since I have a couple. I want as many as possible. So I'm just using the same techniques you saw me do before. So I did speed this up double time and I'm getting my iris, my pupil, a few little lines in there to look like the texture of the different colors of the eye. And this time I think I'm going to add some uh, stylized eye eyelashes at the top. So I'm going to carve some straight lines going up uh, to give it that effect. So much fun. I love how that looks. It's really eye catching. See what I did there? And then again, I'm gonna use that dry brush to kind of shake off the crispies, as I call them, and clean up the area. And you can do this as your clay dries because, you know, as you carve into the clay, the clay has to go somewhere. So that's a really great technique to get your clay nice and clean. I'm gonna jump around because I have like an hour of footage of me carving more eyes and cleaning. And you don't need to watch me do every second of that. You're going to make a clay pot where you get to experiment with what you're doing. And so although the techniques I'm teaching, I'm not saying they're not important, but you don't need to watch someone step-by-step step make something. The best way to do it is to practice, to try things out and to fail. I can't tell you how many times students have had to start over or their clay just completely collapsed on itself or it dried out too quickly or things broke off. That's the best way to learn is to make a mistake uh, or to try it out and have a success. So I'm not gonna show you every step of the way because again, we're talking, this video would be like four hours long and I'm just gonna kind of speed things up as I have been doing and just show glimpses of the process I'm making, um, carving in eyes, cleaning up with the same tools, using the brush, just to get this exactly the way I want it to look before it goes into the kiln. 
So I never feel finished, but I think this is about as good as I'm gonna get with the time that I'm allowing myself. Could I add more? Of course. And as it's dried out, I'm loving all the fun little eyeballs I created. And now I wanna test it out. What happens when I put my light in there? So I have this tea light. It is battery operated, which is super cool. I bought these on Amazon. And as I was afraid of, it almost doesn't fit, but it does. You could use a real candle. Just keep in mind wax is gonna be an issue. Now this is before I put it in the kiln, so be so very careful if you're trying this out at home because clay is more fragile the more it dries. I knew that this was pretty small, so I do have the candle in there, um, but clay shrinks by about 10%, so I know this candle probably won't fit. I'll have to get a different one. I'm gonna cut out the lights and it's already super cool. The glowing is awesome. Now my classroom has full windows, so even with the lights off, you can't really see it in its full glory. Cannot wait to put this in the kiln. I'm going to glaze it and then I'll do another video showing you as it looks when it's glazed and all lit up. Thank you so much for sticking around and making art with me. If you're interested in more clay tutorials, check these out. Find me on Instagram at thatartteacher underscore Machado to see what my students are up to in my classroom. And find my website, thatartteacher.com for full length lesson plans, student examples, rubrics, and all of my lessons for free.